Hello, glad to have you join us again for our Sunday Bible studies coming to you here from University Church in Waxhatchee, Texas. We are continuing with our special series on the life and ministry of Jesus. Uh, this is our uh, third session for uh, this series. And so if you have not been able to view, the, uh, if you were not with us for the other two, the beginning two, uh, first two, then you might want to go on our YouTube site and view those at some point. Uh, but today we're going to move on from where we finished up uh, in our uh, second uh, uh, session. And so thus far we've been through these uh, six uh, parts of the uh, story of the life and ministry of Jesus. Uh, last week we talked about the beginning of his ministry and uh, selecting uh, his disciples. And then we also started discussing uh, his ministry of miracles. And we pretty well completed that discussion, except for the last three miracles that we're going to discuss, which were uh, Jesus raising uh, people from the dead. And then after that, uh, we will move on to talking about the ministry, uh, Jesus' ministry of uh, teachings. Uh, and so let's, uh, let's move on in our study here. Uh, whoops, there we go. Uh, so among the signs and wonders that uh, uh, Jesus performed, there were three occasions when he raised someone from the dead. The first was uh, the son of a widow woman from Nain, Jesus and his disciples were walking along one day and they uh, came upon this funeral pr procession in which the son of this widow woman, her only son, was in the, in the casket. And when Jesus found out these circumstances, he uh, raised this, he touched the uh, casket and raised this son back to life and presented him to his mother. So that was the first uh, raising of someone from the dead recorded for us in Luke chapter 7, uh, verses 11 through 17, if you want to read that for the details. And the second one was the raising of the daughter of a man named Jairus. And uh, Jairus was a synagogue ruler. And it's interesting uh, that this is among other uh, miracles that uh, Jesus performed uh, in uh, for people who were associated with the the synagogue, and this is kind of interesting for, because for the most part the Jews, uh, re, uh, as we know, rejected Jesus' ministry and eventually crucified him. But Jairus' daughter was ill, and he persuaded Jesus to come to heal his daughter. But while they were on the way, uh, the daughter died. And so when Jesus arrived, uh, he ordered everyone out and he went into where the young girl was and spoke to her and uh, raised her from the dead. Recorded in Matthew chapter nine, uh, Mark chapter five and Luke chapter eight. So and notice that this particular one is in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. Only Luke recording the other one of the widow's son. And then the third and final one was the raising of Lazarus. And this was especially, this is an especially important part of the fourth Gospel, of John's Gospel. Uh, as you can see here in John chapter 11, some 44 verses are dedicated to uh, this uh, event. Uh, the occasion was that this is near the end of Jesus' uh, three-year period of ministry. And uh, Jesus' life had been threatened by the religious leaders on a number of occasions prior to this. And so he had uh, left Jerusalem and gone back to Galilee. And while he was gone, uh, Lazarus became ill and passed away. Now, Lazarus 
was the brother of uh, Mary and Martha, and Jesus was very, very close to this family. These uh, were uh, very dear, cherished uh, friends. Uh, Jesus would often stay in their home uh, when he was in the Jerusalem area. Uh, he would uh, stay with them, and so uh, they were very, very close, and Lazarus was considered to be one of Jesus' uh, most uh, 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 close friends. And so uh, when uh, Jesus uh, found out that his friend Lazarus was ill, he intentionally did not go back uh, to Jerusalem and heal him. And uh, this was kind of amazing because uh, Jesus has had the practice of healing individuals. And Mary and Martha and Lazarus all knew that. But after uh, Lazarus passed away, a word reached Jesus concerning this. And Jesus told his disciples that they were going to go back to Jerusalem because uh, and the, uh, because um, Lazarus had passed away and uh, and I think Jesus said he was resting and they thought he was just had become better but the matter of fact is he was resting in the sense that he had passed away and so they go to Jerusalem and when the, by the time they arrive uh, Lazarus has been dead and buried for three days. So he is absolutely unequivocally, no question about it, he is, he is dead. Uh, and so when he arrives, Mary and uh, Martha are grieved and they uh, speak about the fact that uh, they regret that Jesus had not been there because they know that he could uh, uh, could have healed Lazarus and him not have passed away. Uh, but then Jesus is going to use this as a teaching, uh, as a teaching uh, event to emphasize the resurrection. And uh, Jesus, so Jesus tells the sisters that uh, Lazarus is going to uh, be raised and live again. And they say, yes, we know that in the resurrection, he will be raised. And uh, Jesus uh, told them that uh, even now he is, Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And so Jesus asked them where he has been buried. And so they take him to the side of the tomb, which is in the side of a hill with a stone rolled in front of it. And Jesus orders that the stone be removed. And the people there object because they say uh, uh, Lazarus will already be decaying and they refer to the odor that will be there and Jesus tells them to do it anyway. And so Jesus uh, speaks and it is though he is speaking to Lazarus himself and he says, Lazarus come forth and Lazarus is raised from the dead and comes forth out of the grave. And Jesus says to loose him, he was bound in the burial uh, material. And so Jesus orders that he be loosed from that and he uh, lived, he was alive. The religious leaders become very, very infuriated about this. And uh, they even plot to kill Lazarus again, if you can believe it, and to kill Jesus for whatever good that would have done. And so this was a mighty miracle that uh, just uh, was just prior to when Jesus would be crucified and then when he would be raised from the dead. So this concludes our discussion of the uh, miracles of Jesus and uh, what and you we have learned quite a quite a bit from these and now we're going to move on to Jesus teaching uh, ministry. Um, Jesus was a teacher like none other. There has never, there never was, and uh, since then there never has been a teacher uh, like the Lord Jesus Christ. One uh, time when the religious leaders sent uh, some individuals to uh, 
go find Jesus and bring Jesus to them. Uh, these individuals came back to the religious leaders and uh, they didn't have Jesus with them. So the religious leaders asked them why they had not brought him with them. And uh, the reason why is because they had been so amazed by his uh, teaching authority. Uh, and they said, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. And so Jesus spoke with great authority. In fact, over and over again, where Jesus would be teaching, uh, the crowds were constantly uh, amazed at his teaching, uh, teaching with authority. And this is a statement recorded by Luke in chapter 4, verse 32. Uh, they, they exclaimed that uh, Jesus taught as one having authority, not as the scribes. In other words, contrasting Jesus with the teaching of the scribes and uh, the point is they are making is Jesus uh, has great, uh, he has great authority in his teaching and that is in contrast to the scribes, Matthew chapter seven. Um, the, the fact of the matter is from the beginning of Jesus' ministry, uh, Jesus was anointed and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Remember our discussing this and all three, uh, in fact, all four of the synoptic, uh, all of the three synoptic gospels and the fourth gospel, all four of the gospels uh, record, if you remember, Jesus being baptized by John and the Holy Spirit descending upon him in the form of a dove, signifying his anointing by the Holy Spirit and his empowerment by the Holy Spirit. And so we went forth from that, if you remember, and overcame the devil and the temptation, the Holy Spirit helping him. And then in Luke chapter 4, remember the occasion of Nazareth where Jesus went into the synagogue and they uh, handed him the scroll of Isaiah and he read Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2, uh, where he's read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he told them that this prophecy uh, of Messiah was being filled right there before their eyes. And he thus claimed that he was the Messiah. But the point right now that we're making is that he was empowered for his ministry by the Holy Spirit. And therefore, that's the reason why he speaks with the power that he does. It is the power of the Holy Spirit working through him. Uh, the main point of uh, Jesus' uh, teachings uh, from the very beginning of his ministry uh, was very simply, the kingdom of God is coming. The kingdom of God is here. And so what Jesus is saying is that him coming into the world as the Son of God and beginning his ministry, uh, this uh, his ministry is ushering in the kingdom of God into, into this world. Uh, this is recorded in all four of the Gospels, Matthew 4, uh, Mark 1, Luke 4, and John chapter 18. Uh, there are over, and so there are over 150 references to uh, the kingdom of God in the New Testament. Uh, actually, it, I, I haven't done a real exact count, but there could be close to uh, 200 references because I think there's nearly 150 just in the Gospels. So the point is that uh, the kingdom of God is a major, major emphasis in the ministry of Jesus. And some scholars like George Eldon Ladd, for example, say that in fact the kingdom of God is the main is the main uh, point of the uh, of the New Testament. But it certainly it certainly is the uh, the basic uh, point and the basic essence of Jesus' teaching ministry, the kingdom of God. And so, the miracles of Jesus, especially as we've mentioned before especially uh, casting out demons, was evidence that the kingdom had come. Uh, Jesus comes, he's anointed and empowered by the Holy Spirit. He's able to do these mighty miracles like no one else can do, uh, especially casting out demons. And so he has power over uh, the kingdom of darkness. So the kingdom of God has come in. However, uh, this... Uh, coming in of the ministry, uh, coming, excuse me, coming in of the kingdom is just really a beginning. Uh, and it's from the beginning of his ministry. 
But from the beginning of his ministry until our own present time, uh, the kingdom of God is is uh, here, but uh, it is also not quite yet. Uh, it's, it's, and so it is said to be already present, but not yet. So it's here. The idea is here. It is here. The kingdom of God is here ever since the beginning of Jesus' ministry is here in the world in a sense, but yet it is not fully completed. And this is the idea that is given to us in John chapter 18, Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and the John uh, the Revelator in Revelation chapter 19, that the kingdom is yet to come. The kingdom is yet to come. And so in Jesus' prayer, for example, he, he, uh, he taught his disciples to pray uh, for the kingdom to come. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So God's kingdom is here now, and there are many, many benefits. The most significant of all the benefits is the privilege of us uh, uh, becoming a part of that uh, kingdom of God right now. So our, our um, uh, allegiance is to the kingdom of God in, in a world to come. However, evil is still present right now with all of its consequences. So the kingdom of God is here. Uh, great uh, miracles and great things can happen because uh, Jesus has come the first time and his kingdom is present with us, but it's not yet completed. And so evil is still rampant and having its impact in the world today. Eventually, however, Jesus will come again. Uh, those who understand the New Testament and believe its message as it is written, uh, believe uh, uh, what it says, and what it says is that Jesus uh, will come back uh, someday. He will come back to this earth. And when he does, he will completely defeat Satan. He will cast him into hell. Uh, read Revelation chapter uh, 19, uh, uh, verses 11 through seven, and I'm not sure what that 10 is, but I'll check it out. Uh, but anyway, Revelation uh, 19, 11 through seven, and he will, uh, Jesus that is, will restore all that was lost uh, uh, in by the fall, that is all that was lost by Adam's sin, as recorded in Genesis chapter three, verse one through uh, 24, uh, where we have the account that uh, after the creation of man, uh, God had told Adam and Eve not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Satan tempted them and they disobeyed God's command and their sin is, is referred to as, quote, unquote, the fall. And so man's dominion over the creation was lost and uh, sin entered in and brought in evil, all kinds of evil, sickness, and eventually death included. But Jesus, when he comes back, he will restore all that, uh, as recorded in uh, Revelation chapter uh, 21, verse 1 through 22. Um, so uh, in the meantime, uh, we're in the middle of a fierce battle between good and evil. And I have to tell you, it uh, seems like as the Bible indicates, the Bible prophesies, as we get closer and closer and closer to Jesus coming back to this earth, this uh, battle becomes more and more fierce. And uh, we are definitely seeing uh, the struggle between the good and evil, even in our own country, in a very special way these days. And so it is really outstanding. But we need to understand that, as Paul said, uh, our our issue is not uh, other individuals in this battle because he says we battle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers in the air. In other words, we battle against the forces of Satan, the forces of the devil, forces of evil. But we're looking forward to that time when Jesus will come, and I believe it's very soon. And incidentally, if you want to uh, study more about this, I've uh, recorded an entire series on end time events uh, that uh, if you go to our website, uh, to our uh, YouTube page from University Church, you can view that entire series. It's several 
several lessons long. And I'm sure, hopefully you would enjoy that. Anyway, as we move along here, Jesus, uh, uh, we uh, uh, asked the question, then how do we get into God's kingdom? We said Jesus, God, Jesus ushered in the kingdom. The kingdom of God is here and available for us now. Uh, and we should all be interested in being a part of that kingdom right now. And so the question is, how do we get into God's kingdom? Well, Jesus himself gave us the answer. Uh, uh, it's recorded in John chapter 3, where one of the religious leaders by the name of Nicodemus came to Jesus and was asking him about this very thing. And uh, Jesus uh, gave the answer when he said, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And uh, of course, Nicodemus uh, was re uh, taken back by that statement, born again, what, what do you mean, Jesus? He said, can, can I enter again into my mother's womb? Well, no, obviously you can't do that. Uh, so what was Jesus talking about? Well, Jesus was talking about being born of the Spirit. In this passage, Jesus says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So we're talking about a supernatural birth, a rebirth, a, a, a new birth, of uh, being born one, once, born of the flesh, but being born again. Uh, to be born again, you have to be born first one time and then be born again and so born of the flesh and then born of the spirit well how do how do how does this happen well number one uh, believe in Jesus and call on his name in Romans chapter 10 Paul uh, talks about this and uh, he says that uh, in in the, this uh, passage uh, I've got it marked over here uh, Romans uh, chapter 10, uh, verses 9 through 13, and I'm going to read verse 9. Uh, if, we conf if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is, is Lord. In other words, if you acknowledge uh, that Jesus is Lord of all, he is the creator and he is Lord of all, acknowledge him as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. Believe in your heart that Jesus, in fact, was killed. He died. He was crucified on the cross. He was taken from the cross, dead, and buried in the tomb. And three days later, he raised from the dead, as we will talk about later. Uh, uh, believe in your heart that Jesus raised him from the dead. You will be quote unquote saved you will be redeemed and then uh, number two uh, ask God to forgive uh, all of your sins all of your transgressions against him the Bible says we in Romans we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God uh, but in uh, 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 now this is not the uh, uh, not the uh, gospel of John but his first letter uh, John, first uh, John one nine, uh, promises that if uh, that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Because the Bible teaches that no sin is going to enter heaven, and the only way that we can be sinless is availing ourselves of the sacrifice of uh, Jesus on the cross for our sins. Ask Him to forgive us, and it is. Uh, at, at that moment that the Holy Spirit does this spiritual uh, 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 work that we that Jesus called being born again. The Holy Spirit will, will do this uh, marvelous, miraculous work that Jesus told Nicodemus about in uh, uh, John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. And so theologically, we talk about this as being regeneration. Uh, uh, and that is a theological term uh, when you pray through and receive salvation from the from God you're regenerated or you're saved as uh, as uh, Paul says in Romans 10 9 uh, redeemed um, and 
and, other, and so all of that is uh, regenerated, uh, regeneration, saved, redeemed, are all synonymous to what Jesus was telling Nicodemus in John chapter 3 about being born again. Um, now, uh, moving on in the teachings of Jesus, uh, to get the full scope of Jesus' teachings, of course, you'd need to read all four of the Gospels, and they're not very long, and so you can read them through in not uh, uh, not too long. You, uh, so you can read all the way through all four of the Gospels to get a good, good, uh, complete view of Jesus' teachings. But the uh, so-called Sermon on the Mount uh, gives the the bulk uh, of Jesus' teaching in, in one setting, uh, Matthew chapters five, six, and seven. And here you have the so-called Beatitudes and other uh, uh, significant teachings of Jesus. And you have a, uh, a, uh, a scale down uh, version of that in Luke chapter six, in just a few verses here, verses 20 through 49. So uh, you can read those and you get the a bulk of Jesus' teachings. But as I said, you, you sometime, if you haven't done so already, sometime you want to read all four of the Gospels and uh, learn about Jesus' teachings. But uh, Jesus', uh, Jesus uh, 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 main uh, teaching method was uh, telling parables and stories. Now, a parable is a is a short story that has a, has a particular point, and uh, some of them, uh, by literature design, are, are referred to as parables. But there's also other stories, and these parables in these parables and the stories, for the most part, uh, they are lessons uh, about the kingdom of God, and in fact, in many of them, Jesus started the uh, story by the phrase, uh, the kingdom of heaven is like, and then he would tell this parable or story, the kingdom of heaven is like, and he'd tell this story. The first one I want to identify is a, a, a parable of two uh, grateful debtors in Luke chapter seven, where Jesus uh, tells, and he actually is asking religious leaders if he said, if you have two individuals and they owe a sum of money to uh, someone and one owes a, a little bit, a relatively small amount, but the other one owes quite a bit and quite a bit more than the other one. But the, uh, the, the individual they owe this money to knows that they're going to have a difficult time paying it back. So he just uh, forgives it. And Jesus asks, which one, which one of the two will be the most great, most grateful? And so that's that story. And then in Luke uh, chapter eight, uh, the story of how the lamps are made for lighting. You don't uh, light a lamp and then uh, hide its light. You uh, uh, don't uh, hide it under the bed, or you don't put it under a bushel basket. Uh, you put it out somewhere where it can give its light. And so the, the point there is that, uh, that uh, Christians are to let their light shine for God, Luke chapter eight. And then uh, the third is sowing seed on different kinds of ground recorded in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew chapter 13, Mark chapter four and Luke chapter eight. Uh, so this one must be pretty important. And what it, it says is, Jesus says, the sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, the seed fell on different kinds of ground. Some uh, fall by the wayside. Some fall in uh, areas that have not been cultivated. Uh, some fall where there's lots of weeds. And some fall, fall in good ground. And depending on what kind of soil the seed falls on, then... Uh, the uh, the results is different. Uh, sometimes if it's a shallow ground, uh, the seed sprouts quickly, but it doesn't have any depth and it withers quickly. 
uh, other seed uh, uh, falls uh, where the weeds are and it's choked out. But uh, that which is sowed on good soil brings forth, brings forth a harvest. And then the, the story of a good Samaritan. Uh, someone uh, asked Jesus, uh, Jesus was giving them basically what we call the golden rule uh, to uh, uh, do unto others as you have them do unto you and uh, treat your neighbor as you would uh, treat your, as you would want to be treated. And so someone asked, well, who is, who is my neighbor? Now notice the question is, who is my neighbor? And Jesus uh, tells this story of a man who was on his way to Jericho and uh, thieves and robbers came out and uh, beat him severely, uh, took all of his uh, belongings and left him in the wayside uh, half dead, Jesus says. And there came along a priest and when the priest uh, saw him, he moved over to the other side of the road. And then there came a Levi. Now, Levi is of the priestly tribe, but uh, so they're both of priestly uh, descent. And uh, he likewise passes, likewise passes by. And then a Samaritan, and incidentally, the reason why Jesus used a Samaritan here is because uh, the Jews uh, despised the Samaritans because they were half uh, read, half uh, half Jewish and half Gentile, and so uh, the uh, uh, Jews did not like them. But uh, he tells the story that the Good Samaritan goes over and uh, ministers to the, the person, uh, 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 anoints his wounds and cleans his wounds and takes him to an inn and provides for his keeping there, and Jesus then ask them who was uh, the neighbor to this uh, person who had been robbed. And of course, the answer is the Good Samaritan. And so uh, Jesus actually uh, uh, answers, the, uh, uh, answers the question of who, who was neighborly here. And then uh, uh, number five, uh, the parable of the tares sown among the wheat in Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30 and 46 through 43. It's a very simple, short little story uh, where the farmer plants wheat and then he comes out and he finds that tares are growing, that is, uh, grassy weeds are t uh, growing among the wheat. And the issue is, do we try to get those tares out of there? And Jesus said, no. Because if you rip out the tares, then you're going to also rip up the wheat. And uh, Jesus says, just leave the tares in there. And uh, when the harvest comes, uh, then the tares will be separated from the wheat. Uh, and so the good is going to be separated from the bad uh, at the end when the, when the harvest comes. And then uh, number six is, the must, uh, parable of the mustard seed. Uh, mustard seed is a very, very, very small seed. And yet Jesus tells the story that if you plant this little seed, it will grow into a large tree big enough uh, for the birds to light in. Matthew chapter 13, Mark chapter 4. Again, all three of the Synoptic Gospels telling this parable in Luke chapter 13. And so uh, this one is one where it says the kingdom of heaven is like. And so the kingdom of heaven started very, very small. Just one uh, man in uh, Judea by the name of Jesus, and it grows to be very, very large. And uh, then the parable of the leaven in Matthew chapter 13 and Luke chapter 13. Uh, and this, the story is about a lump of bread and the the baker puts leaven in it and the leaven goes throughout the entire loaf of bread and causes it to rise and so the kingdom will kingdom of god again this the kingdom of god is like this and so the kingdom of god will be will go from uh just in a little area 
and spread everywhere. And as, as we know, uh, Christianity is all over the world today and the kingdom of God will get uh, very large. And then uh, hidden, hidden treasure, treasure. Uh, sorry about that. Hidden treasure, uh, Matthew chapter 13. The uh, point here is that uh, there's a, uh, one finds a hidden treasure and uh, uh, go and sell everything in order to purchase that. And so uh, the kingdom of heaven is worth whatever it costs. Same point with the costly pearl, also told in Matthew chapter 13, the following verses after the one above, for verses 45 through 46. And so you find this costly pearl, and it is so valuable, it's worth selling everything that you have in order to go out and buy this costly pearl. So the kingdom of heaven is worth whatever price, whatever cost it takes for us to be a part of it. It's, it's, it's worth that. And then chapter, I'm excuse me, not chapter, uh, number 10 is the parable of the dragnet in Matthew, also in Matthew chapter 13, immediately following of the two above. And the story is of how a large a fisherman go out and catch a large, large catch of fish. And there's some good fish and some bad fish in there. And so you take the bad fish out and you keep the good fish. And the kingdom of heaven is like this. Uh, the unrighteous will be separated out and will leave only the righteous in the kingdom of God. And the righteous are those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, as we talked earlier. Now, we're out of time uh, for today, uh, but uh, next week uh, we will continue uh, talking about the teachings of Jesus. And the next uh, parable that we'll be looking at there is the parable of a wedding guest uh, uh, in Luke chapter 14. But uh, thank you for joining us for this session. And uh, we will be looking forward to having you back with us again uh, for our next one. And in the meantime, the Lord bless you. Have a wonderful week and stay safe. God bless.